Hello guys welcome to my humble YouTube channel where I bring you fanfiction that will brighten your days. Before we start a subscribe is greatly appreciated and don't forget to leave a like and ring the bell icon so you won't miss exciting new fanfiction stories. True God in Another World, Tensura X Tibate, by Tempest underscore King underscore 20. Chapter 13 Picnic Rimuru Pav It had been a long and exhausting day since I single-handedly destroyed the hideout of a slave trading ring. The atmosphere was still filled with a mix of relief and tension as we basked in our victory. Now, it was time to make crucial decisions, it had been decided that all the people here, along with Kyle and his group, would now follow me. I informed them that we would set off early in the morning for the place that Rinia had mentioned. Rinia had given me a medallion that held the power to teleport us to our destination. The medallion, I discovered, was a relic built by ancient mages or jinn, as they were known by another name. After collecting all the provisions we could salvage from the destroyed hideout, including food, money, and anything useful or valuable, we embarked on the search for one of the transport gates. On our journey, we engaged in conversations about various topics, discussing plans for our future and the steps we would take to ensure their newfound freedom and independence. During our conversations, Lena turned her attention toward me and asked the question that had been lingering in everyone's mind. By the way, Rimuru, where are your parents? Her gaze, followed by the curious eyes of my comrades, locked onto me, awaiting my response. With a momentary pause, I spoke, the weight of my words evident in my voice. They're in Zyrus. Due to certain circumstances, my brother and I had to part ways with them. At first, they believed us to be dead, but we managed to get in touch with them and assure them of our safety. What a stroke of misfortune to be separated from your parents at such a young age, mused Alfred, the old elf with long white hair like snow and eyes as blue as the sky. He had a white skin and a fighting body. The only reason the slave traders could catch him was because they had the people of his village as hostages and because of his injury. I offered a small smile, casting my gaze away from the group. Indeed, it was difficult, however, it was through that separation that I met my first true friend. So, I wouldn't say it was all bad. You must have quite a special bond with this friend if it was worth the sacrifice of being separated from your family, Kyla interjected, stepping towards me with curiosity in her eyes. Yes, we quickly became close after meeting her. She has become an incredibly important person not only to me but also to my brother, I replied, my voice filled with a mixture of nostalgia and gratitude as I remembered the day Sylvia entered our lives. Less than. Greater than, so, what about your brother? Where does he live? Alfred asked, casually pushing aside a low-hanging branch that obstructed his path. He's actually living in Eleanor, in the royal palace, I replied, as we continued walking. We stumbled upon some slave traders who were kidnapping a young elf girl. After we rescued her, we accompanied her to Eleanor, only to discover that she is the princess. Silence fell upon the group as they halted, their faces reflecting a mixture of astonishment and disbelief. Goodness gracious! Alfred exclaimed, his voice filled with genuine disbelief. Let me get this straight. A four-year-old who not only awakened his core, but he is also a quadra elemental augmentation and two deviances. And to top it off, you saved the elven princess and now live in Eleanor with the royal family? I must confess, I may need a moment to process this astounding turn of events, or perhaps I'll just succumb to a dramatic and perfectly timed heart attack. Laughter filled the air as we all found solace in Alfred's comical response. With our spirits lifted, we continued our journey, the air around us becoming peaceful and serene. Eventually, we arrived at a dark cave where an old, dilapidated teleportation gate awaited us. However, Seal had managed to repair the gate before we reached the cave. After confirming its functionality, we crossed the gate, finding ourselves standing in front of several aging buildings that were surprisingly still suitable for use. A small river flowed gently beneath one of the structures, adding a serene touch to the surroundings. Needing a moment to rest and gather our bearings, I gathered everyone together once again, informing them that this place was merely a temporary hideout for our group. I proceeded to explain the tasks and responsibilities expected of them now that we had reached our destination. As the groups were formed and duties assigned, I appointed Alfred as their leader in my absence. To assist him, I handed him several books on the basics of training, including instructions on how to develop a monocore for young individuals and the mana rotation technique. Fortunately, Alfred possessed a deep understanding of magic, 
enabling him to comprehend the contents of the books and pass on the knowledge to the others. Nevertheless, I made a vow to personally train them whenever the opportunity arose, ensuring their growth and development. As the division of tasks drew to a close, a familiar voice called out from behind me, causing me to turn around. Rinia stood there with a gentle smile, her presence moving closer to mine. The dim lights of the hideout cast a soft glow on her face, emphasizing the twinkle in her eyes. Things seemed to be going smoothly, Rinia remarked, her voice filled with a sense of relief. I didn't expect this adventure to conclude so swiftly. I nodded in agreement, my attention briefly shifting to Alfred, who stood nearby, giving orders with an air of authority. The determination in his eyes spoke volumes about his commitment to our cause. They knew what happened to their other hideouts, so they were preparing to leave, I explained to Rinia, my gaze locked on Alfred's commanding figure. I have to hurry up with my plan or they will run away. Rinia's brows furrowed slightly, her expression laced with concern. She studied me in silence, as if searching for the right words to convey her thoughts. Finally, she sighed, her voice tinged with a mixture of hesitation and genuine care. Rimuru, I hope you understand that what I'm about to say may contradict my actions from yesterday, Rinia began, her gentle voice filled with conviction as she looked at me with piercing gaze. Her words caught me off guard, and I couldn't help but feel genuinely curious about what she had to say. What I did was because I was hopeful for Decathan's chances in the war, but I don't think it's a good idea to focus so much on the war. What do you mean? Confusion inevitably seeped into my voice evident in the furrowing of my brows as I tried to comprehend her viewpoint. Rinia took a moment to gather her thoughts, and as we stood there, time felt as though it slowed down, allowing the weight of her words to sink in. I don't know who you were in the past, Rimuru, but now you are just a four-year-old child, she explained with a softer tone, attempting to balance her resoluteness with gentleness. While I understand your hope and determination for Decathan's chances in the war, I don't believe it is healthy to entirely focus on the impending conflict. Silence enveloped us, the gravity of her words hanging in the air. I took a moment to absorb her concern, acknowledging the truth within her perspective. Gradually, my gaze dropped, and the weight of the immense responsibility I had placed upon myself seemed to weigh heavily on my shoulders. Rinya's voice broke the silence, laced with empathy and understanding. Don't carry this burden alone, Rimuru, she urged, her hand gently finding its way to my shoulder, offering comfort and support. You are still young and there is ample time before the war commences. Allow yourself to explore this captivating world and find joy in the company of your family and friends. I am certain that your parents wouldn't want you to carry such an overwhelming responsibility by yourself. Her words resonated within me, their profoundness and kindness stirring a sense of warmth and relief amidst the heaviness that had been weighing me down. I met her gaze, gratitude etched within my eyes as I nodded, silently acknowledging the wisdom in her words. With a reassuring smile, Rinia led the way, opening a gate that transported us to her house. Waiting just outside the house was a lavish carriage, pulled by two majestic horses. With a final goodbye, Rinia helped me into the carriage, her warm gaze assuring me that everything would be all right. As the carriage began to move, a blanket of silence enveloped us. The only sounds that broke the stillness were the rhythmic trot of the horse's hooves, pulling us forward with a steady grace. Seal and Sylvia, their ethereal presence intertwined with my soul, remained quiet, their presence serving as a constant source of comfort and companionship. Lost in contemplation, I mulled over Rinya's words, her wisdom echoing in my thoughts. The weight of the impending war pressed upon my young shoulders, threatening to overshadow the joy and wonder I had initially felt upon entering this magical realm. The responsibility of safeguarding my family and their happiness tugged at my heartstrings. A reminder that my actions held consequences beyond my own desires. Yet, Rinya's logic began to seep through my doubts like tendrils of hope. While the sanctity of my family remained of utmost importance, it didn't mean that I had to sacrifice my own happiness and exploration. I reminded myself that I was just a child, allowed to bask in the wonders of this new world and discover my own place within it, uninhibited by the heavy burdens of a king. As I gazed out of the carriage window, the world outside unfolded in all its splendor. Verdant forests, teeming with life and mystery, stretched as far as the eye could see. Rays of sunlight filtered through the colossal trees, casting dancing shadows that seemed to whisper secrets. The air carried a sense of tranquility and safety, enticing me to embrace its embrace fully. 
However, my eyes were drawn to the edges of the forest, where a thick fog rolled in, its presence shrouded in intrigue and enigma. It was as if the fog held secrets waiting to be unraveled, much like my insatiable curiosity for the floating cities of the ancient mages. The allure of the unknown tugged at me, weaving an invisible thread of adventure and discovery. When we finally arrived at the Grand Palace, a maid graciously greeted me at the entrance. She bowed respectfully before leading me through the ornate hallways, adorned with tapestries depicting heroic tales of the realm. The fragrance of freshly cut roses perfumed the air as we made our way towards the dining room. After finishing a delectable breakfast served by the ever gracious maid, I eagerly inquired about Grandpa and Art. The radiant smile on the maid's face revealed her genuine warmth as she informed me that they were currently rehearsing in the backyard. With new clothes adorning my young form, I made my way to the courtyard. The sound of laughter mingled with the gentle rustling of leaves as I approached. There, I found Art diligently squatting, his eyes filled with determination, while Gramps guided him in channeling his mana. As I approached Arthur and Grandpa, I greeted them with a casual, yo. Arthur saluted me without breaking his pose, while Grandpa turned his attention to me. Oh, Rimuru, you're back. How was your visit to Rinia? Grandpa inquired with genuine interest. I took a moment to catch my breath before responding. Nothing eventful happened. We were just talking, and she gave me some valuable advice, I explained. Wanting to make myself comfortable, I used my earth mana to create a chair to sit on. How is my brother progress? It's running smoothly. There are no problems so far. Virian stood up. All right, Rimuru, let's put aside your brother's progress for now. Are you ready to continue your training? He asked, tossing a wooden sword towards me. I knew all too well that Grandpa had a particular penchant for exploring and pushing the limits of others' strengths, making every training session a thrilling experience. I couldn't help but share his enthusiasm. You won't let me rest, will you? I chuckled, understanding that Grandpa's relentless dedication would fuel our training session. His smile widened, a mischievous glint in his eyes as he nodded, confirming my assumption. With a sigh mixed with excitement, I took a deep breath, and the familiar surge of mana flowed through my veins enhancing my body in preparation for what lay ahead. Four months after reaching Eleanor, three and a half months after Rimuru rescued the slaves. Arthur Lewin Pav waiting eagerly outside my room was Tess, adorned in the most darling ensemble. She donned a pristine white sleeveless sundress, accompanied by a delicate white sheer cardigan cascading over it. Her head was adorned with a whimsical sun hat adorned with a delicate pale flower, casting a soft, ethereal glow upon her. As Re emerged from his room, his attire exuded simplicity and elegance. A crisp white shirt perfectly complemented his earthy brown pants. Meanwhile, I opted for a light brown shirt paired with dark brown pants, hoping to blend seamlessly with the vibrant surroundings of Zestier. Took you too long enough. Hurry, let's hurry. Impatience radiated from Tess as she eagerly seized our hands, insistently tugging us forward. Following her lead, we embarked on our adventure through the bustling city streets. The enchantment I had experienced upon my initial arrival to Zestier was not diminished, but rather, magnified as I witnessed the remarkable sights and sounds once more. As we got off the carriage and start walking, we took time to visit the numerous stalls and stores that the city had to offer. While the three of us, Rimuru and I in particular, were met with a lot stares from the fact that human children were holding hands with their kingdom's only princess, I couldn't be concerned about who I was holding hands with. What bothered me, was that, while most of these gazes only held curiosity, some stares were filled with blatant hostility. Stepping off the carriage, we embarked on a leisurely stroll through the vibrant thoroughfares, taking our time to explore the myriad of stalls and boutiques that dotted the city. Yet, amidst the enchanting ambiance, Rimuru and I, in particular, drew attention due to our ostensible connection with the kingdom's princess. As countless eyes bore into our beings, I found myself unconcerned with these trivial observations. However, beneath the curiosity that loomed in most gazes, I couldn't help but notice sporadic glares tainted with unmistakable hostility. As I emerged from the armor shop, I politely stepped aside to let a passerby go by. I was about to continue on my way when suddenly, an elven child bumped into my shoulder. A smirk played upon his lips as he uttered a venomous remark. HMPH. Well, if it isn't the human brat that Elder Virian has taken under. I have heard tales of your presence. Disgusting, I seem to have acquired human germs on my clean attire, he sneered disdainfully, 
his face twisted in disgust. It was clear by the clothes of this child, who couldn't be much older than Tess, and the attendants following behind him that he was a noble. After spending so much time with Tess, I had almost forgotten how immature children could be. I couldn't help but think that, whether they were an elf or a human, spoiled nobles always seem to act as if they've been taught out of the same manual. He then turned to face Tess, his once arched eyebrows now relaxed into a well-practiced smile that revealed perfectly straight, pearly white teeth as he offered her his hand. Princess, it is beneath your regal stature to associate yourself with these mere human brats. Allow me to graciously escort you around, he urged, expecting Tess to receive his hand. Not even sparing him a glance, Tess linked her arm with mine and Re, her movements exuding a resolute confidence. With icy precision in her voice, she rebuffed his offer, her words laced with a tinge of disdain. Art, Re, let us depart from this place. There appears to be a minuscule creature headed in that direction, and I have no intention of soiling my new, exquisite shoes by inadvertently stepping on it. As Tess propelled us forward, I couldn't help but cast a pitying glance towards the noble boy, a silent acknowledgement of the pathetic display he had just made. However, my sympathetic expression seemed to further enrage him as he hastily quickened his pace, desperately attempting to catch up with us. Hold it, brat, I'm not done with you, he shouted, running up to me and gripping my shoulder tightly on my shoulder like a vice. I heard you're pretty talented for a human mage, he sneered, around here, I happen to be a pretty well-known genius myself. My mana core has already reached the red stage and, aside from water manipulation, my mother said that I'll soon even be able to manipulate plants. I maintained my composure, allowing a hint of sarcasm to lace my response. Oh my word, Princess Tessia. It seems we are in the presence of pure genius here, I feign surprise, my voice dripping with insincere admiration, I am not worthy. Tess, unable to contain her laughter, released a melodic giggle. Meanwhile, Re struggled to suppress his own amusement, his hand over his mouth in a futile attempt to stifle his laughter. I'll be sure to give you proper respect Lord Genius of the Elves, so if you'll excuse us, as I started leading Tess away, a handkerchief flew past us, landing on the ground. I turned back to see the noble brat's face, reddened like a ripe tomato, glowering at me. The attendants and friends surrounding him gasped quietly, their shock palpable in the air. How dare you initiate a duel with one of the disciples of Elder Virian? Tessia's voice held a sharp edge as she narrowed her eyes into a glare. You may be of noble blood, Faerith, but you should still know your place, take it back. A vein bulging on his forehead, Faerith's anger burned brightly. His face contorted with indignation as he contemplated his next move. I'm sorry, princess, but my father has taught me never to let my pride be stomped, he retorted, his voice dripping with arrogance. Arthur, Ready yourself for a duel or retreat with your tail between your legs. Know that your actions reflect your mentor as well. The choice is yours. Some of the people nearby had overheard and had already started to gather around us. Tessia looked uncertain about all of this, but just nodded my head and took a few steps away from us. I didn't want to cause a scene since I was a visitor, but after weeks of stifling meditation and training, my body was actually eager for the chance to fight. Princess. Please do me the honor of initiating the duel, Faerith declared, smugness lacing his every word. He nonchalantly polished his sleek black wand with the sleeve of his robe, the gesture intended to intimidate. I watched Tessia roll her eyes, her expression betraying her exasperation. Let the duel commence, she reluctantly declared. Foolish human named Arthur, Faerith spat, his wand raised and ready. Prepare yourself, this genius will show. Without allowing him to finish his boastful sentence, I lunged forward, closing the distance in a blur of motion. My palm struck his gut with precision, his breath expelled in a sharp gasp before he was sent careening backward, his body tumbling painfully to the ground. The eyes of the spectators widened in disbelief as Ree's laughter filled the courtyard. Tess quickly rushed to my side, a mix of concern and amusement flickering in her eyes. She grabbed Ree's hand, still chuckling, and pulled us away intent on avoiding further unnecessary attention. In the quiet sanctuary of our escape, Tess explained the unsaid customs of dueling. It became clear that Faerith had intended for the duel to be a mere display of each other's magical talents, not a physical confrontation. Gramps, upon learning of the incident, found it utterly ridiculous, 
dismissing the duels between nobles as foolish and utterly superficial when it came to gauging one's true magical prowess. It was disappointing to realize that the shock radiating from the onlookers had little to do with my fighting prowess. Instead, it stemmed from my blatant disregard for the established customs of dueling. The rest of the day passed by without any notable occurrences, until dinner time arrived. With a quick change of clothes, my brother and I made our way towards the grand dining room, eager to enjoy a meal with the royal family. It had been almost a month since our arrival, and to our surprise, the king and queen had accepted our presence to the extent of allowing us to sit with them at dinner. As we reached the entrance, the butler graciously opened the door for us, stepping inside, we were met with the warm smiles of the royal family. Ah, re, art, come in, we have been waiting for you, King Alduin greeted us with genuine warmth. Nodding in response, my brother and I took our seats, with me occupying the chair to the left and Tess to Rhee's right, where Rhee was between me and Tess. Across the table, Queen Muriel sat on Alduin's right, and Gramps took his place on the left. Once we were settled, the maids gracefully placed the carefully prepared dishes before us. The spread included crispy bacon, perfectly scrambled eggs, an assortment of fresh fruits, and a comforting soup. As we began eating, Queen Muriel turned her attention to us. How was your outing today? She inquired, genuinely interested in our activities. It was fine until Art decided to ignore a customs in dueling and beat up a brat of the nobles, Rhee replied, feigning annoyance. I couldn't help but laugh at his sarcastic remark. How was I supposed to know? I retorted, joining in the playful banter. Curiosity peaked, King Alduin leaned forward. Tell me more about that, he requested, eager to hear the details. Tess chimed in with excited enthusiasm and began recounting the events of our day, embellishing the tale with a few additional comments from Rhee and me. Ah, Rimuru, King Alduin addressed Rhee directly, we've made all the necessary arrangements for your departure tomorrow, including a carriage and anything else you might need. Clang the sound of a spoon clattering against the plate caught our attention. We turned to see Tess, her face filled with surprise and sadness. E.H. Re, you are L leaving? She stuttered, her eyes brimming with tears. All eyes shifted to Re, a mix of confusion and concern evident in our gazes. Had he not informed Tess? Re shook his head and redirected his gaze towards her. Yes, Tess, I am leaving tomorrow but, before Re could complete his sentence, Tess interjected, her voice choked with emotion. No, I don't want you to leave, her tears threatened to spill over. Re let out a slight sigh and rose from his chair, making his way towards Tess. With a gentle touch, he rested his hand on her head. I'm only going for two weeks, Tess, and then I will be back. You don't have to be sad, Re reassured her, his voice filled with warmth. Sob, really? Tess asked, tears streaming down her face. Re flashed her a comforting smile and fetched a handkerchief from his pocket, tenderly wiping away her tears. Yes, really? I am going to visit my parents, but if seeing you so sad is going to weigh on my heart, I would feel guilty for leaving, Re explained, his eyes locked with Tess. And I know you wouldn't want that, right? Tess nodded, her sorrowful expression gradually transforming into a glimmer of hope. So I want you to bid me goodbye with a smile tomorrow, okay? Oh okay, Tess agreed, her voice quivering as she fought back her tears. Re beamed at her once again, his hand gently patting her on the back. All right, I will head to my room now to gather the rest of my belongings and get some rest. I have an early start tomorrow, don't I? Re turned towards King Alduin, seeking confirmation. Alduin wore a sympathetic smile as he nodded. Indeed, you do. Rest well. Re acknowledged the king's words with a nod. Thank you. Good night, everyone. With those words, he bid us all farewell and made his way towards his room, leaving behind a bittersweet atmosphere at the dinner table. Rimuru Pav less than you're so good with kids, I didn't expect that greater than Sylvia observed, her voice filled with surprise, as I walked out of the dining room and into the calm sanctuary of my room. A soft smile tugged at the corners of my lips as I responded, greater than greater than I had students before, so I know how to deal with them, less than less than. Curiosity danced in Sylvia's eyes as she asked, less than him, how were they, greater than? Pausing for a moment, Memories washed over me like gentle ripples on a tranquil pond. I recalled the vibrant energy and mischievousness that radiated from those young souls. Greater than greater than well, my first impression of them was that they were energetic and a little feisty, 
less than less than I began, my gaze distant yet fond. Greater than greater than but they were good-hearted and sweet kids. And as they grew up, they became dependable adults who eventually became heroes in the eyes of humans. Less than less than. Sylvia's voice held a glimmer of excitement as she continued, less than it must feel good to see the kids you taught grow up to be amazing people. Greater than. A rush of pride swelled within me as I remembered the way these once mischievous children had blossomed into remarkable individuals. A small smile played on my lips, casting a gentle glow in the room. Greater than greater than yeah, it feels good, less than less than I replied, my voice imbued with a mix of nostalgia and gratification. Changing the subject, Sylvia's tone carried a subtle thrill, less than leaving that aside, are you ready for tomorrow? Greater than. I nodded, curiosity piqued by her evident enthusiasm, greater than greater than yes, but why are you excited? Less than less than. Less than its secret greater than she replied, a light chuckle escaping her lips. As I settled into my room, a faint worry tugged at the back of my mind. I hope Sylvia isn't planning something. Pushing aside those apprehensions, I slipped out of my everyday clothes and indulged in a quick, refreshing shower. Afterward, I carefully selected the clothing gifted to me by the elves, though I knew blending in seamlessly with the human kingdom would be a challenge. Gathering all the essentials for our journey, I watched as delicate wisps of black smoke began to coil and twist, revealing Seal emerging from the shadows. Over the days, Seal and I had grown accustomed to our nightly routine of cuddling finding solace and comfort in each other's presence. Though it had initially caused a twinge of embarrassment, the intimacy had become a cherished part of our bond. With a final glance at Seal, I climbed into bed, my mind now consumed by thoughts of the upcoming trip.